Well, good morning, Stone Creek. That wasn't too bad, considering you can't see me. No, I didn't miss my cue. Uh, I'll clue you in on what's happening right now, man. Today's message is entitled, Hide and Seek. And the million-dollar question is, where am I? You know, we all, we all know how hide and seek works, right? You count to ten, close your eyes, and then someone goes off to hide, and you have to go figure out where they are. So I have done that. And I'm really good at this game, especially in this building, because I have done this dozens of times here. We do it for staff meeting regularly, so I know all the best hiding places. So, so, so where am I? Man, I, I, could be, I could be behind the drum kit. I could be hiding in the baptistry with a snorkel. I could be maybe out in the lobby behind the connect desk, and you passed me as you came in. Man, I could be in... I could be in a bathroom stall with my feet pulled up where you couldn't come in and see me. I, I could be anywhere. I, I could also be in plain sight. I could be sitting at the row you are in right now. Why don't you take a look to your right and see if I'm there. What about behind you? Look behind you. Am I behind you? Maybe I'm in the rafters. That would be an amazing entry, wouldn't it? Look up. See if I'm there. Man, man, we all know what it means to hide, man, where nobody can find you in it. And it's awkward when you hide because you're in a cramped space sometimes, maybe in the dark. You're trying to avoid being seen. You're trying to avoid being noticed. You don't want to be heard, and so you hide. And maybe even in a place where you're not sure if there's something living back there that may get you while you're hiding. But then sometimes we hide in plain sight. We just disguise ourselves. And, man, it's really an awkward way to communicate, if we're just being honest. Imagine if this is how we spend the rest of our time today, with me talking to you while, while I'm hiding, like you know I'm here somewhere, but you, you can't see me. You know, I think, I think we all know that we don't just play hide-and-seek as a game, that we play it with our lives, that all of us are hiding. Sometimes we pretend Sometimes we put our best foot forward so other people will have a certain thought about us, a certain image about us, a certain idea, preconception about us. Man, we want to cover up any areas that could appear like they don't measure up, they don't fit in, maybe that they're dirty or maybe that they're unacceptable. Man, it takes a lot of sideways energy to always be hiding, to always be pretending. Man, we always want to be sure that people have the right perception of us. We would never want them to reject us. But it's not until we get in plain sight that we can live the life that God has created for us to really live. Like, why is it that we hide? Why is it that we're so good, good at it? I mean, it all boils down to one word. And that one word is shame. And shame is sabotaging our lives and it's wrecking our souls. And have you ever done something like, I wish I wouldn't have done that? And it could have been last week. Maybe, maybe, maybe one of you moms in here yelled at your kids. And you thought, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't have done that. I can't believe I did that. It could have been five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It could have been when you were a kid. You did something and you knew better. And you wish it wouldn't have happened. It could be some failure that you had. A failed relationship. A failed marriage. A failed business. And you just feel this sense of shame that's settled into your soul. It could be something that happened to you, that you had no part in. It happened to you, and you don't know, how could this happen, and why would this happen, and why would they do this to me, and what's wrong with me? And we don't measure up. Shame literally means to hide, to cover yourself. And that's what shame does. That's what shame does in our lives. And shame is a little bit like this. It's like a gremlin that's downloaded a podcast into your brain and push repeat. And the message is never good enough. And you're never smart enough. You're never rich enough. You're never handsome enough. You're never skinny enough. You're never kind enough. You're never experienced enough. You're never successful enough. You're never strong enough. You're never... Never good enough. Man, if we don't learn to shut shame down, he's going to grab his cousin guilt 
move into our spare bedroom and claim squatter's rights. And it's suppressing God's best for you. It's diverting God's plan and it's burying you under a weight of embarrassment, humiliation, and regret. And as it plays over and over in our mind, what happens is we begin to believe that it's the truest thing about us. And the things that we've done, the things that we don't like about ourselves, the failure that we had, that thing that was done to me, we begin to believe it's genuinely who, are, who we are. And it sinks deep into our souls and just becomes part of what we carry around on a regular basis. And we walk into a room and we think it goes before us. And we want to make a decision and it's always holding us back. Sometimes we're conscious of it, many times we're not. But what if I were to tell you your shame is not the truest thing about you. Come on. Your shame, man, your regret, your bad decision, your sin, man, your humiliation and embarrassment, not the truest thing about you. This is the message of the gospel. This is the beauty of what Jesus came so that we could experience freedom. Like what if there was a different way for you to live? And what I believe is that today, And in the room, we carry a lot. And some of us carry some significant shame. Some of us carry something that we wouldn't consider it to be shame. But I believe that God wants to set some people free today. I believe that God wants to bubble up some things in our lives so that we could deal with them, that we could quit hiding them and suppressing them and hope that they go away. Because guess what? They haven't, have they? So we're going to look back in the Bible and just look at it. Man, where did this all start? How do we get here? So let's open up our Bible. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be in Genesis. We're going to be in chapter 1. Conveniently enough, it's on page 1. So you can go there if you have a paperback or even in your Bible. It's going to be on page 1. And uh, we're going to look at, we won't look at the entire story, but we'll look at, I'll tell the story and highlight a few verses for us. As you may may or may not know, in the beginning, it says God created the heavens and the earth. And that's where Genesis starts. In the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. And God began to create so much that was good. And then he creates Adam. And he puts Adam in the midst of the garden. And he says, hey, have at it. Like, name the animals. Bring, uh, cultivate the, the plants. Grow your own food. Just bring order to everything that I've created. This is what I want you to do. Then it says in verse 18, it says that God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Ladies, how many of you already know that? It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. In other words, he crowns creation with Adam and then Eve. And Eve comes alongside so that he, she and Adam can both, of equal value, of equal worth. I should get an amen right there. Of equal value and equal worth, right? Equal, full of value, full of honor. That like they can together bring order to God's creation. This is what they're created to do. And this is how it starts. And so... Eve comes along, God creates her out of Adam's rib, and then Adam says, this is at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man, the first poem we have in history. And then it says this in verse 24, a man will leave his father and mother, anybody need to be reminded of that right now? (laughs) Leave his father and mother, that was just extra, that was free. Um, You're welcome, ladies. And (laughs) hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. So let's just think about this for a second. We've got creation. They were both naked. And the word that's used there is not ashamed. Like, why is that there? Like, like there's a lot of other words you could put there. Am I right? You could have put, like, naked and happy. You know? You could have put naked and frolicking. That's a nice way to say it. But naked and not ashamed, like what is that about? There's something there that's powerful. If that's the word that's used in the beginning of creation when everything was formed, when man and woman were put together to live in relationship, to live in community with each other as we're all created, not ashamed. We were created for a world without shame. We were created where we can stand across from someone and not feel judged, not feel like we don't measure up, not feel like we're less than, and where we can also honor them. We were created with honor. We're created with value. We are created so that we can experience honor from others, 
but also express honor to others. So when Adam and Eve looked at each other, they just thought of value. They thought of a valuable person. So think about how we honor people. Like, like honoring someone means it's like kind of going to Chick-fil-A and them saying, what? My pleasure. And actually meaning it. Because we know they get paid for that. Honor means that the customer is always right. And they are. We were created for value, not to be judged, condemned, looked down on, feel like we didn't fit in, feel unacceptable, not have this memory of this thing that we've done or this failure that we had or this regret or this embarrassment. We're not supposed to live with that. That's how we're created. But we know that's not how it goes, don't we? We know there's a problem. And we see it emerge quickly in in chapter 3. We know that Adam and Eve sinned. We know that... um, God had said, don't eat of, these two, of this tree, knowledge of good and evil, and they did. And so in that moment, everything changed. A world that was with honor all of a sudden becomes a world with shame. Verse 7 in, in chapter 3, it goes like this as we pick up the story. It says, the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Like, how did that go? Like, like, we look at that now and how humorous that is. It says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And God called to the man and said, hey, where, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Naked and afraid before there was naked and afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. And so here we have the fall. Here we have where creation is torn in two. Here we have is where everything changed and shame enters. Shame enters into the world. A world that was with no shame all of a sudden becomes a world dominated by shame. And not just a world, but our own lives become dominated by shame. Man, as we look at what shame means and how we define it, I want to kind of draw a distinction between guilt and shame. So guilt is something I've done. Okay, I did something wrong. That's true. I did it wrong. There's some punishment that goes with that. There's a consequence that goes with that. So, but, but shame is when I take it and I make it my identity. So here, here's a little example of that. So let's say you lied. How many people have ever lied? Let me look, check my kids. I don't know. We've, that's an easy one, right? And we've all lied. How many of you lied this morning? Don't raise your hand. Just kidding. Oh, I was the only one raising my hand. But anyway, we lie. And then that, that's true. You lied. And what shame does is shame says, you didn't just lie, but you are a liar. You're a liar. It's who you are. It defines you. Shame will say, man, I I was angry with my children. Guilt will say that. Shame will say, I'm a terrible parent. And there's this progression that happens. And it goes like this. So, so. On one hand, something happens, it could happen to you, to cause you shame, to cause you to think you don't measure up, or something that you've done, and we'll say, what a shame, and that's a shame. Shame on me, it's kind of out there. But then there's a next level, when someone will say to you, you should be ashamed of yourself. Ever had that happen? Parent, teacher, coach, adult, you should be ashamed of yourself. And in that moment, what happens, it moves from being out there to being in here. Because all of a sudden, I should be ashamed of myself. It becomes part of my identity. I began to think that about me. I began to believe that about me, that the deepest and truest thing about me is the thing that I've done wrong. It's my shame. But then it goes a step further. I am so ashamed of you. You ever had anybody say that? Because all of a sudden it's gone from just me, me being ashamed, me having shame, me knowing about it, to now everybody else looks at me with shame. Everybody else looks at me as if I don't measure measure up, if I don't have value, as if I'm different than everybody else. It moves from something that was ashamed and now everybody thinks I have shame. And there's a lot of ways that this comes into our life, isn't it? And there's a lot of ways, a lot of areas, small and big, that it happens in our life. So some of you, maybe you grew up poor and it brought shame into your life. Think, man, if I'd have just had more and we could barely make ends meet. 
So if you're a little like me, I grew up in a home where my dad was an entrepreneur and we had, he had several businesses that went under. I can remember in high school that I had, I'm lived in six different houses and not because we were upgrading, <laughs> but because one was foreclosed on and another we got kicked out of because we were renting and couldn't pay the rent. And I moved over and over and over. I can remember once coming home to, with a friend of mine who brought me home and as I get there, the utility man is in the front yard and he says, do you live here? I'm like, yeah. He says, son, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut your electricity off. Your parents haven't paid the bill. That, my friends, is called shame. That's something that will live with you. How ironic it is that God would now place me in one of the most affluent areas in the world. Like, that's the beauty of the gospel. I mean, some of us are ashamed because we're poor. Some of you are ashamed because you're rich. Like, this is how I know this. Let's say you do get a gift for Mother's Day next week. Um, and hopefully it's from your children, right? Because you're their mother, just saying. But let's say you get a gift and you get a brand new purse. And somebody comes up to you and says, what a great purse. And you're like, yeah, it was a gift. My kids got it, but they got it on sale, they told me. Or maybe you're wearing a brand new pair of shoes and someone says, I love those. Where'd you get them? You're like, oh, these, they were on sale. I got a really good deal on them. Nobody ever says, I paid full retail for these. Because there's some sense of shame. What about guys? Like, you get a new car. Someone says, man, dude, love that ride. That's amazing. And you're like, yeah, yeah, you know, our other one, it just broke down. It was 100,000 miles. I had, to, I had to have this, you know. I had to. No, you didn't. <laughs> you wanted it. You can afford it and be proud. And we're ashamed at times because we're rich. It's like the guy who has to come home and tell his wife he lost his job for poor performance. And she's three months pregnant. And it, it, it's like your son grabbing your cell phone and, and beginning to look at it and you realize then all of a sudden that there may be something on there you wouldn't want him to see. It could be your husband looking through your text messages and you realize and there may be a message trail that could bring some shame and embarrassment. You know, I've, I've talked to cancer patients and, and they've asked me, like, what's wrong with me? What did I do? Am I, did I eat something wrong? Did I, did I do something wrong in order to get this? And, they, have, and it's, has, they didn't do anything for that. There's just this shame and embarrassment that comes on our life. There are some of you that next week when Mother's Day rolls around, you're not a mom. And you so desperately want to be. It's everything that your life is geared around. And you don't understand why God hadn't come through. And there's this sense of shame as if you're inadequate to be a mom. And it's... It's not true. Man, there's that promiscuity from high school or college, man, where you can't seem to shake it or you can for a little while, but it seems to crop back up and we just have this shame that rides over us. It's when you try to go on that diet this time, I'm going to work out, I'm going to go on a diet, I'm going to do better and fall off the wagon. It's that time you say, I'm going to stop drinking, I'm done, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to look at this anymore. I'm not going to engage in this anymore and all of a sudden you do and that shame just begins to overwhelm you and it dictates everything about your life you don't even realize it and you hold back and men and women we experience this differently don't we so for women it's, it's you're never good enough you're never you're never good enough at home you're never good enough at the gym you're never good enough in bed you're never good enough at work you're just it's never good enough and my god what pressure to have to look at every airbrushed female every single day and you just, the message you're getting is you're never good enough. And for guys, man, do I have what it takes? Like, can I come through? Can I provide? Man, can I be a good husband? Can I be a good dad? Can I be a good employee? Like, what does that look like? Man, and why is it that I don't feel like I fit in? Why is it that I don't like black coffee, bourbon, or cigars? <laughs> and man, we just have this sense of shame that sinks deep into our souls and it holds us back and here's our response man we hide just like Adam and Eve and we hide the Lord God called to the man and said where are you he says I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid I was afraid man did, did, did he not think God knew where he was like, like, like did he not think oh yeah I created all the hiding spots I know where they are but in those moments of shame, you don't really care. You just want to get out from that situation. It says he was afraid. It doesn't say he was afraid of him. Certainly he was afraid of God. 
I'm certain he was afraid that Eve would see him. For who, so they sewed, they sewed together leaves to cover themselves. And then they hide in some bushes as if God wasn't going to find them. Listen, we hide, but it's just a lot more sophisticated, isn't it? We're just a lot better at it. Sometimes we hide behind our personality. For men, we call this posing. We fake it till we make it. It's kind of how it goes. There's an author named John Eldridge who says this. He says, when you meet a man, what you meet is an elaborate fig leaf called his personality. You know people, they hide behind humor. Man, they hide behind self, kind of forced self-confidence. Sometimes they hide behind controlling a conversation. And if you're ever in a conversation with somebody, man, and you know, they, they always keep it surface level. And they're always the one asking the questions. They're always the one dictating the topics that you're talking about. It's because possibly they have something they're hiding. They may not even know it. And it may, what I've noticed is when children when, uh, who grow up and they, people grow up in a family of a, have some significant dysfunction, maybe some, some uh, bankruptcy or maybe some alcoholism or something that was really serious, man, when you meet them as adults, they just always want to be the one in charge of the conversation because they don't want to share anything. I mean, have you ever met somebody and they close their eyes when they talk to you? Sometimes that's a... That's just a symbol of, man, just hiding, not wanting to be seen. We hide behind our personality. We hide behind excess, and we buy a lot of stuff that make us look successful, to make us look like we fit in, to get in the right house, and the right car, and the right neighborhood, and the right community, and the right stuff. So and it's, just this, it's just this really weak attempt for us to kind of fake it and prove that we fit in. And not that anything's wrong with any of that. And we hide behind excess. We hide behind our kids. Anybody guilty of that? And you say you just want your kids to be successful, to have what you didn't have, but in reality, it'll make you feel a lot better about yourself. We hide behind our kids. We hide behind gossip. You ever notice that if you can talk about how bad someone else is and how they don't measure up, it helps you feel a little better about where you don't measure up, and it diverts people's attention to somebody else other than you, and you can be sure they're not looking at you, so it's a, it's a form of hiding and judgmentalism, achievements. What about the gym? And we go for the perfect body on the perfect diet and try to appear like we got it all together because we have some shame in the past. Maybe it's some body image shame. Maybe it's some confident shame. We just want to fit in. Man, we hide and we're masters at it. And we have a lot of money we can spend on it. We have a lot of opportunity dress it up. But the reality is, if we're honest, we're all hiding. There's something in all of us like, I don't want anybody to know about this. I feel insecure. I feel like I don't measure up. I feel like I don't measure up. This, Stone Creek, is the beauty of the gospel. Is that you can be found. Now let's talk about how great it is to find stuff. You ever lost your cell phone and found it? <laughs> Greatest moment of your life. <laughs> what about maybe it was your keys? You ever lost your keys and found them? Amazing. You ever lost like your dog or cat? Well, maybe your dog. Have you ever lost your dog? <laughs> Being found is beautiful. Think about this. Even if you're playing hide and seek, nobody wants to stay hiding forever. Like, true story. When my kids were young, um, we'd come in, and we'd be watching TV or something, and um, I'm sure I was praying, Debbie was watching TV, and so we'd come in, <laughs> come in, she's not here right now, so she'd come in, and they'd want to say, let's play hide and seek, and we'd be like, yeah, that's great, you guys go hide, exactly, <laughs> they go hide, a little bit later, they come in like, you're not finding us, <laughs> we're coming, we're coming, y'all go hide. Some of you are shaking your head like, yeah, that's us. I didn't really do that, but now I want to talk to you after the service. <laughs> no. But here's the reality. You know, everybody wants to be found. Nobody wants to stay hiding forever. Everybody wants to be found, and you, my friends, are found. Jesus has come so that we could be found. Let's look at this passage and how it unfolds what God has done for us. Man, the first thing we see in this passage is that God pursues us. Man, God pursues us. God comes looking for Adam and Eve 
in the cool of the day. He knew what had happened. He knew where they were. He knew how bad it was. He knew that things had changed forever. He knew that this was the first. He knew everything that was going to happen, every ramification of this. He knew every form of evil, every form of darkness, every form of abandonment, every form of injustice, every form of tragedy that was coming because of their behavior. Yet, he comes after them. Like when people come after you, there are times when you, if you know what they want, you'll let yourself be found, and sometimes you won't, based on their intentions towards you. When someone calls and says, can I speak to Stephen? You know what I say? Who wants to know? Because I want to know. So what is God's intention toward us? Man, in our shame, in our regret, in the things that we've done, the things that have been done to us, in our embarrassment and humiliation, what is it? We see it in John chapter 3, one verse we know so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. We know that verse, but watch this. It says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He didn't come so that we would be judged, that we'd be cast aside, that we would lose our place, but so he could restore us to a place. Like this is God's intention towards you, Right? Not to condemn us, but to rescue us. God is pursuing us. And maybe you're here today because God's been after you. And maybe there's something that's bubbled up in your heart because God's coming after you today. Because he knows there's something holding you back. He knows there's something that makes you feel insecure. And he wants to set you free. Man, God, God pursues us. God will also, man, God will also expose us. As uncomfortable as that is. Man, God will also expose us. You know, because we think if we can't see God, he can't see us. I, when my nephew was about five years old, he recently just graduated, um, for, I got a master's degree, so he's really smart. But he, he comes running into the room, and I don't know what he's doing. We have a, they had this big toy bucket, and he just puts his head over in the toy bucket. Like, what are you bobbing for apples in here? Like, what's up with this, dude? And then my sister comes after him, and he's in trouble done something wrong he has some shame and he thinks if he can't see her she can't see him (laughs) that's what he thinks and so this is how we live man we try to avoid God and push him away and get away from him because we're think he can't see us but God wants to expose the thing that's bringing us shame hey hear me when I say this God can't heal what stays hidden I'm gonna say it again God can't heal what stays hidden. And God desires truth deep down in our soul. God wants truth. God wants us to be whole. In Psalm chapter 51, verse 6, says this, God, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Here's where shame grows. Perfect conditions for shame to grow. Where it gets enough water, where it gets enough sunlight, where it gets enough photosynthesis, everything it needs to grow, everything it needs to sink deep roots into your heart and wrap its tentacles around your throat and strangle you. Shame grows in silence. That's where shame grows. And we keep secrets, we hang on to these things that that, that are holding us back and giving us shame. That's where it grows. But the kryptonite for shame, what releases its power is confession. It's confession. You see, when something's exposed to the light, it loses its power over us. And it's how we give our control back over to Jesus. And so for you, this is probably the step for you. One of the reasons why we know it's so important to fight for relationship in our church is because this is how we're set free. And it grows in silence. There's something going on in your life that you need to tell somebody about. It's one thing to pray it quietly and give it to God. It doesn't become real until you tell somebody else. Especially because shame is such a community event feeling. Remember, I'm ashamed of you. Because it's so tied into our relationships, we have to tell other people. So it may be some of you, when you get home this afternoon, there's something you need to share with your spouse. And it may be you need to have a close friend that you can share some things with you. And there's some things going on in your life until you tell someone you will keep doing that, looking in that, thinking in that. And so we need to believe in confession. And there's power in that. Man, God wants you to be free. And this is why we're created this way. God 
man, he pursues us. God exposes us. But then God covers us. Now, in, in this passage in Genesis chapter 3, it says that God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and he clothed them. In other words, no more leaves for you. Real clothes. And this is a prediction, a foretelling of what Jesus is going to do for us. I mean, that Jesus came for us, and he came and pursued us, and he finds us, and he wants to cover up the things in our life are shameful and holding us back. And we know that as we believe in him, that the fact that he died on the cross and his blood was shed, that it covers us and it makes us white. So, and so in Revelation chapter 3, it says it like this, the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments. White just being that, that symbol of purity and innocence and wholeness, so that we get white. So here's how it works. Man, when we begin to follow Jesus, when God looks at us, man, he sees the righteousness, the white garments of Jesus, and we have a place, we are accepted, and if God accepts us, does it really matter what anybody else thinks? Because we are apple of his eye. And people who live in this confidence, people who are able to put aside shame and to shut it down, they live differently. Man, they live differently. They live confident lives. Man, they're not worried about what next step to take. They're not worried about what other people think. They're not always trying to put themselves in the best light, use the smoke and mirrors to be sure they're, man, they can just be themselves because they know they're accepted and loved. I mean, they live courageous lives. They're not held back by anything. They can take a risk. They can experience new things. And someone who's experienced this, they have rest. They don't have to try so hard, striving to prove themselves. Listen, your shame is not the truest thing about you. Your shame is not the truest thing about you. And it may be today that you need to talk to God about what you've been talking to yourself about, as we learned last week. It may be that you need to learn how to shut that podcast off. It keeps playing over and over and over and over in your brain. So we want to do that today. So as we close today, here's how we're going to close. And for many of you, and you, this is, you don't even have to go into a lot of detail, you know. And you know what's holding you back. You know you experience this. You know that shame is a part of your identity, your personality, how you make decisions, how you live your life. And you feel, man, you feel anywhere from dirty to just like unworthy and you don't fit in. And we want to talk to God about that. And we're going to do it through worshiping. So I'm going to invite the band to come back out and a song that's become a fan favorite for us. Man, and we just want to sing. And we just want to tell God and what we think of him. And we want to tell God what we think about our relationship with him. And, 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 I, and we know that, man, there are times when God moves in a moment that you need to have an opportunity for someone to pray over you and to bring God into it. So what we're going to do is we stand and sing. We're going to have some of our trained care team in the back. Man, they'll be there for you. You just walk up to them and say, I need you to pray for me. That's all. And they'll pray over you in the moment. It'll be a way of you kind of beginning this idea of confession, beginning to tell, beginning to confess, beginning. And then we'll continue to worship. So let me pray for us before we go. So God, we're just, uh, we live in a life that's broken and we're less than what you've called us to be and, we're, and we fall short and we're reminded of that and Satan wants to use it against us but you want to use it for us. God, you want to restore our future. You want to use our pain to help others grow. Man, you want to use our story as we just begin to tell it over and over again, as we begin to realize that we're still acceptable. Man, we still have a place. We still measure up, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done. And so, God, I just pray for those here, man, who just, it's not just an audio podcast, but it's a full screen video playing in their mind of their shame, God. The things that they look at, the things they're addicted to, the mistakes they made, the way they've talked to people, Man, they just look at it and they feel like they can never get past it. And God, I pray that right now in this moment, as a moment of healing, a moment of hope, a moment where we can shut shame down and move into the future, a moment where we can stop hiding, man, because there's nothing to hide from. And when we hide, we're really just hiding from you. And you have such good for us. And I pray in these moments today, God, that we would believe that. Well, we just lift up Jesus right now. God, I just... 
man, with everything in my being, God, just elevate his name and his worth, his beauty, his majesty, his forgiveness, his kindness, his grace, his honor. And we just pray in his name. Amen.